Well, what I started to say was that uh, vocal pedagogy is not science's job. So uh, it's only when it's when we're looking for scientific studies focused on vocal pedagogy that I, that we need pedagogy informed science. Because as, as you pointed out, I mean, that's just that that's not the primary job of, of voice science. You know, it has a whole range of uh, goals and objectives. Anyway, the other piece that I wanted to throw out, and maybe this is opening a can of worms we don't need to go into tonight, but uh, this gets back to actually Julia Bentley's question earlier on about terminology. <clears throat> and just my take on this. There is a move, or there is, there's always interest in defining the terms very exactly so that we're all talking very and communicating very clearly with each other. I get that. But I think that there can also be a tendency to push that too far. Science needs very precise terminology. It's very clearly agreed upon of, of all the people that are doing the, those projects. I don't feel that way so much about pedagogy. We do need to be able to understand each other and have enough common ground in our vocabulary. But as, as a colleague in, in Britain, uh, Alex Ashworth, has pointed out, from various studies, all language is metaphorical. All language is metaphorical. It's it's representing something other than the sounds and the symbols that we use. And I think we could be a little bit more magnanimous with each other, uh, and not uh, you know insist that everybody call it chest voice or mode one or modal or you know. In my own work. I have tried to find continuities between historic terminology and what we're learning from voice science in other places. And I do try to, to connect them. So for example, uh, you know, I voce accusa, voce aperta, terms like that that have been historically used. My feeling is this, teachers that use historic terminology that was very, descriptive frankly of subjective sensations for the most part trained a lot of successful seniors when i had trained as many successful i'll say in my lane opera singers as they have then i'll be maybe feel cocky enough to diss their terminology meanwhile i'm actually looking for continuity for with the great teaching and great singing that went on before me and i, I might choose to adapt and maybe not use some of the terminology, but I'm not going to uh, get on a high horse about it. So I'm not so much on this. We have to all use the same objective terminology. I think that we do need to, it, I think the conversations are very useful because we do need to understand each other in these conversations. But uh, that's, there's a little bit of a side issue, but uh, I, I wanted to throw that out as well. Uh, as, as a part of the teacher, experience <laughs> I, I like that ken and I, I i agree when i'm in the studio i do not care what you know as long as the student and i are on the same page about what i mean by what i say then fine yeah. i think we we want to uh, strive in written pedagogy to you know to try on the same page that will that will speed you know make more efficient writing but in practice who the heck cares how many registers you say there are? You know, get, get yourselves on the same page between you and your student and, you know, and go from there. Yeah, we just it. don't need uh, terminology police. <laughs> I agree, I'll start walking the halls with a little siren, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you said flagellon, hmm? 